So welcome. Um, let, let me start with a question to um, to Joran, uh, and the same to uh, to Bill. Um, you know, migrants are people, and they face really the same challenges, but additional ones as well as the general population. So, Joran, how how would you categorize the specific health challenges facing migrants, and what differences are there with um, everybody else. Thank you and good morning everyone. Pleasure to be here. Um so sitting in Panama, I, you know, it's an interesting nexus of migration, right? We're getting a lot of migrants both from the Americas region as well as transcontinentally. And to get to the Panamanian side of the Darien region, which is jungle, we traverse about 67 miles of very rugged terrain. So we actually see the highest um uh, condition that migrants present with on the other side are really traumatic injuries, right? So fractures, bone breaks, um, deep tissue wounds, and other abrasions. And it's very complex to treat or manage that type of an um, injury in a very rudimentary, you know, reception center camp setting. Um, behind the injuries, we see about 20% each skin diseases and diarrheal diseases. Of course, crossing the river, ingesting um, unclean water, poor sanitation along the route. Uh, those are the, probably the top three syndromes that we see. Um, I wanna make a plug to say we also see some of the immediate acute effects of interruption and in chronic care disease management, right? So you can imagine the complexities of traumatic injuries if you're diabetic, what that means for wound care, um, but also um, cardiovascular disease and interruption in blood care, blood pressure um, therapy or other therapeutics that they're using. So that would kind of be the constellation that we see in the acute phase. And I think the biggest thing I could comment on is what we don't see but we're aware of, and that's the psychosocial impacts. Um, sometimes it's not vis visibly or physiologically present, but um, about 3% of pediatric migrants that have come through in the past six months stop speaking upon exiting the Darien Gap based on just the intense trauma that they've experienced and seen. So I'm gonna yield to my colleague, Dr. Papp, to share his perspectives as well, thank you. I, I share uh, essentially uh, the same experience. I think migrants are the most vulnerable population, but at the same time, they are the most motivated. I think that when uh, a receiving country have people who are willing to uh, lose their life, uh, going through waters when they don't know how to swim, uh, in fragile boats that are likely to uh, be destroyed at any time. Uh, they are doomed to succeed. This is the strong motivation, and I would certainly hire such people at any point in time because of that strong drive that they have. But what we have noted uh, also is the fact that uh, they are subject to gender-based violence, particularly the women, because they uh, get involved usually with uh, people who tell them to pay a certain amount so that they have protection, and those are the same people who are going to take advantage of them. Uh, they usually also are people who sacrifice everything they have uh, the small piece of land or the motorcycles to uh, essentially get involved in this uh, treacherous adventure, not being sure that how the end is going to be. And when they are returned, they are willing to come back uh, and risk essentially uh, the, the same uh, in the same venture to be sure that they are able to, to get away. So uh, essentially, uh, it affects particularly women and children because those are the most vulnerable. They are the ones who died at sea as well because they don't know how to swim, uh, so-called boat people. But uh, th this is a very sad story. Thank you. Um, Dior, um, infectious diseases 
uh, are actually no longer the leading cause of death in the world, uh, including the global south. Uh, and uh, chronic disease management uh, has become increasingly important in global health, though it's not well funded. Um, can you discuss some of that, uh, make some comments on that in relation to the whole issue of migration? Thank you so much, um, Dr. Jakak, for the question and to the symposium organizers for inviting me to speak today. And I just want to say that it's wonderful to be back. I'm a proud alumna of the Milken Institute School of Public Health. So wonderful to be here. Um, so at IRC and the International Rescue Committee, we recognize that low and middle income countries have the highest burden of humanitarian crises that are driving um, displacement and migration, and they're also disproportionately affected by non-communicable diseases. Um, but compounding these issues in these fragile and conflict-affected settings, there's an um, inadequate health systems to deal with these issues and in place for diagnosis and treatment. And compounding this, um, the traumas that um, our other panelists described and daily stressors and mental health conditions also exacerbate NCDs. And so we see that crises are really a risk magnifier for NCDs. Um, so in spite of this, um, as you mentioned, the response for NCDs is very underfunded. Only about 1% to 2% of uh, development assistance for health is allocated to NCDs. And so this is a huge issue. Um, just to quickly mention one or two things that the IRC is doing um, through uh, the onset of a crisis, um, through the recovery period, is first of all to ensure um, uninterrupted, uninterrupted treatment for patients that are already diagnosed, focusing on prevention of NCDs, um, and also strengthening the health system capacity to deal with these issues. Um, we've also um, really focused on advancing self-care to empower patients and families to provide their own um, uh, services, be that self-medication, self-monitoring of blood pressure, for example, and promoting um, patient education and self-awareness. And finally, I'd like to really emphasize promising models uh, that we um, implement around community-based treatment of um, chronic care, um, especially those delivered by community health workers. Thank you. Thanks. Um, maybe back to Yoran uh, and uh, Bill again. Uh, Geskio, of course, made it, you know, became famous for the work on HIV initially, on uh, tuberculosis. Um, of course, the, you know, in, in the sort of traditional ways we've looked at migrant health, we've often tended to look at it from the vantage point of the recipient country. And there's been a lot of emphasis in this country, in the United States, about the increased uh, risk of tuberculosis in the foreign born compared to. Uh, um, can you say something firstly about risks for HIV and TB in migrant populations? And secondly, the issue of access to treatment. Um, what, what sort of experiences have you, can you share some experiences on how to deal with, uh, tr with treatment for HIV and for tuberculosis, which both require long-term treatment uh, in such, uh, you know, in, in migrant populations? Um, Bill, do you want to start and then perhaps you're Sure. Uh, HIV used to be the first cause of mortality in Haiti for three decades. It's now the seventh cause of mortality, accounting for 5% of, of cases. So uh, if you screen people for HIV, even in refugee camps, your yield is going to be very low. So we don't advise a screening for HIV anymore, unless you have a patient documented with tuberculosis, and we know that the risk is much higher in that group, or, or a woman who's been raped, we automatically will do an HIV test. So that's now the only time uh, we we'll do it, or if we know that the mother is HIV infected. But uh, tuberculosis is a different story. Uh, we screen for the US and Canada in our lab uh, all people who are going to live permanently in the US or, or Canada. So it's done uh, in our place and it's done by a very really, uh, rigorous method of, of screening. 
uh, but in, in camps in particular, we screen anybody who has a cough, a uh, persistent cough, or has fever that uh, we cannot uh, look into the origin. For those people who do gene expert tests, we do a uh, chest x ray. And if we suspect tuberculosis, which are very high, uh, and this with a gene expert within an hour and a half, we have uh, the results, they are started the treatment immediately. Uh, so, that, uh, that it's important in closest uh, TB center from, from where they are located. So, that's usually the way it's done. Just thinking about the transitory migration in Panama, we do have PEPFAR funding available to screen um, migrants, the daddy in upon egress from the jungle for HIV. Uh, I think that what's interesting is even the framing. We we hear that we're, you know anecdotally that HIV and TB are higher among migrant populations. And I think what we're actually seeing to some degree is that there's a bit of a syndemic going on because the same factors that would elevate one's risk for HIV and possibly TB are likely push factors for their departure from their countries of origin or wherever else they may be migrating from. So um, there's a lot of complexity in managing HIV in that setting. We benefit from the HIV testing, not just um, for diagnostic, but also for post-exposure prophylaxis given the high rates of sexual assault and gender-based violence that occur along the routes. A lot of the um, nefarious agents who are smuggling, for lack of a better word, they're leading the migrants through the path and charging them. There's often transactional and forced sexual encounters to pay um, a migrant's way. So women are obviously disproportionately affected. I think the other um, thing that we're also really grappling with is drug resistance. Um, for both conditions, you do require a steady supply and continuous treatment to have the maximum impact and also evade resistance. We also have migrants coming from countries that have a higher prevalence of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, and they've had interruptions as well. So I think um, we continue to see a lot of complexity in maintaining the right um, composite of drugs, not just your first line therapies, but being prepared to manage resistance and the challenges with trying to screen for um, resistant subtypes in a highly mobile population. The average migrant spends less than five days in Panama. So you could imagine trying to persuade someone to hold so that you could do the appropriate genotyping or phenotyping to really determine what's the best route of treatment. Most will decline and choose to continue to Costa Rica's border. So I think those are just some of the complexities. I'm very grateful to the funding that PEPFAR can afford us, but that's a piece of the puzzle. And I think we still have a, a far ways to go in terms of reaching that in that very concentrated, highly mobile, quick moving population. So um, thanks to combined support from both USAID and CDC, Colombia and Panama, um, under the leadership of PAHO really, are piloting a data share across border continuum of care um, model for migrants. So because the who's the provider at the last camp in Cockley, Colombia, is passing the information as received permission to and Red Cross in Panama, so that certain migrants that are coming through on the other side will, will have some idea we can pre stock and pre stage specific materials for some of the complexities. I think the next step is to try to push that along the Central America Isthmus as much as possible and eventually get to a place where instead of relying on that handoff, there's a centralized data repository for migrants that you could access to provide the best quality care. There, there is, um, there, there's more discussion on global health needs, um, but not a lot of data about this. And what kind of services can be provided? And do we have actually data on, on the impact of such services for such vulnerable groups? Do you want to start, Lior? Sure, thanks for highlighting this critical issue. And, and it, it's 
one statistic is that one in five individuals that are affected by conflict will experience mild, moderate, or severe mental health conditions. So it's um, quite significant. And during the peak of crises, um, some evidence suggests that the rates can actually double. Um, so in terms of, um, and, and I would add that within this, um, the needs of women and girls are particularly overlooked. Uh, they face exposure to conflict, um, IPV, intimate partner violence, sexual and gender-based violence, and other traumatic experiences, even in settings where they're supposed to be safe, right? So even once they reach um, host communities or um, settlements or camps. Um, so. In terms of um, what we're seeing that can work, um, we see strong evidence um, for really integrating mental health into primary health care services um, and as well into other services like nutrition, like sexual and reproductive health. Um, another promising example um, in Jordan, we're actually using um, artificial intelligence whereby users with unmet health needs, mental health needs, and often they seek other barriers to seeking care, be that stigma, cultural, et cetera, lack of trust in the health system. Um, they can use an, an app um, called through a program called Inform MH, so Inform Mental Health, um, that helps to assess their needs and then link them to locally available services, be that formal support services or informal services um, in the community, um, as well as um, self-care interventions. Um, so we do see positive results um, for these types of interventions. Um, but again, there's you know, inadequate funding, in, inadequate human resources. And so really ensuring that continuum of care that um, Dr. Blanchet mentioned earlier, from providing more basic support services to mental, for mental health to that more specialized care for those that need it um, is really critical. And um, honestly, this also requires prioritization um, by national governments or organizations to reduce these barriers to mental health care. Thanks. Um, and Bill, could you uh, could you say make a few comments on the sort of specific diagnoses that you know are being seen and the specific interventions that are being offered and the the impact they have? Okay, um, we've had the experience after the 2010 earthquake, uh, particularly for women and adolescents. Uh, they. Had, we had focus group for, the, for them, and we noticed that they had a lot of disturbance, uh, particularly uh, fear, anxiety, uh, suicidal thoughts, uh, PTSD. And uh, essentially, what we did was, if it was an adolescent girl uh, or a woman, it's tried to provide her with some support for school or some support also for vocational school and trying to remove them from the environment as soon as possible. We found that uh, having community health workers, uh, helping them, people that they know, that they can trust, uh, make a huge difference. So we are evaluating that now in another setting, which is the situation of population displaced by gangs. And we saw that it is much worse because many of the women have suffered gender-based violence and uh, they actually see those guys all the time. Uh, and it's important to remove them from that environment. Otherwise, uh, they are in a table situation. Uh, we had uh, Jacqueline Charles, the Miami Herald journalist, who spent uh, a week with us at, at Gescu, looking at the situation of uh, such women. In some cases, it's the it's a girl, 11 years old, um, who was raped by multiple people, uh, who became pregnant, uh, didn't tell anybody, she became too late to get an abortion. Uh, abortion is illegal in any way in Haiti. And uh, at the same time, uh, having to deliver a baby that she didn't care for, did not want to take care for, it, it, it's, it's a huge problem. So uh, this situation is complex 
And uh, we found that when it's produced by gangs, it's much harder than what happens with natural catastrophe. But uh, we are we are doing everything we can with community health workers who are trained actually by uh, well-known psychologists to do the job because we lack the human power to. Just to say that um, having spent four years in Haiti, the work that Geskill was doing, particularly on gender-based violence is nothing short of amazing. So I wanna echo that this um, adaptive approach where you're using the community to really fill that gap and meet the needs of the populations. We saw firsthand the impact that it had, not just on the well-being of that woman mentally, but even the physiologic. So better HIV outcomes amongst the HIV infected women who had benefited from those services. So mental health is public health. Thanks. Uh Okay, I'm I'm gonna we're gonna wrap up this uh, this panel shortly. Um, one final topic um, before I ask a specific question to all three of you: um, women and children obviously have specific their own specific health needs. Uh, Leo, do you want to comment on uh, the the needs of women and children in migrating populations? Um, sure. So most displaced people around the world are women and children. It constitutes the majority. And the global community is at a critical juncture because reductions in maternal and newborn mortality um, have stagnated. Um, and I think a large part of this is, is driven by the issues faced by displaced populations. So 58% of global maternal deaths, 37% of newborn deaths, and 36% of stillbirths occur in countries um, with current appeals for humanitarian um, assistance. Um, so we're not going to meet these targets unless we meet um, the needs of these populations. Um, in terms of um, examples to bridge this gap, I mean, understanding that um, these are contexts where, in addition to underlying crises, be it armed conflict, disaster, um, the whole health system um, is um, fragile. You have disrupted referral pathways, long distances to facilities, human resource shortages, um, as has been highlighted, um, high turnover of staff and brain drain, and then shortages of critical commodities. So um, when we think about um, how do we begin to address these huge issues, um, I think one thing to really consider is, again, the use of community health workers. We have work in Burkina Faso, for example, providing advanced distribution of misoprostol to women um, for home births so that um, postpartum hemorrhage being one of the leading causes of maternal deaths. Um, this is an effective approach to preempt that. And then um, the community health workers or traditional birth attendants accompany these women to health facilities for follow-up care and referrals as needed. Um, Self-care interventions, which I also mentioned with regards to NCDs, we find to be um, effective as well, um, be that um, self-managed contraception, abortion care, et cetera. Um, finally, I'd like to highlight um, how to treat um, malnutrition and undernutrition, which we know um, is a, a huge issue and a huge contributor um, to um, other um, infectious diseases um, and um, as well as to death. And so um, one uh, element to highlight is really that to treat children who are suffering from the most severe form of malnutrition or wasting um, is to emphasize simplified approaches. So um, an IOC study in Mali called the um, Combined Protocol for Acute Malnutrition Study or COMPASS and found that um, malnutrition wasting could be effectively treated by treated through a simplified protocol of plumpy nut or ready to use therapeutic foods, um, ideally delivered by community health workers using simplified diagnostic measures and simplified dosing. And um, so I think you know these approaches that are really adapted 
to the needs um, and that are agile um, when um, there are changes um, are really it's what's going to be needed to move the needle. Um, yeah, thank you. And I mean, thank you to all three of you for the work you do. Uh, obviously, that there are, I think, generalizable conclusions from some of the very diverse experiences, but obviously, um, some of the issues and solutions are very context specific as well. I bear that in mind, but would still would ask you the final question to all three individually. If if you could, if you had to choose one to three specific interventions or changes, be they political, economic, technical, medical, social, one to three advances that would improve the situation of migrant health or make their lives easier, what would they be if you had a wish list? Bill, you can go first. <laughs> uh, using your own experience, I'll start by a non-medical intervention, which is a consensus one, that is making sure that you have a committee in charge of taking care of the population. Because this is not something you're going to do for them, it's something you're going to do with them. And that committee making sure to have at least 30% women, if you can have more women, the better, uh, because they're the driving force. And this is the committee that's going to determine that food will be equitably distributed, that you'll have potable water. They will decide when to put the solar poles, usually near the showers and the toilets. That's where women get uh, attacked. Uh, we usually give a whistle to each woman in case they see something, suspect that they can alert others, and it's very, very effective. And we have practically eliminated gender-based violence by, by using this kind of method. So this would be my number one. The number two would be to have a census of the population because you cannot, you cannot intervene unless you know how many adults, male, females, pregnant women, uh, adolescents, children under five, uh, handicapped people, uh, sick people. Uh, this is essential. The third thing is that uh, we conduct a uh, daily survey by community health workers to determine whether they have disease that could cause epidemic in the camp. That is, we look at uh, fever, we ask them daily, do they have fever, cough, and cough, we're looking mostly for TB, diarrheal disease, we're looking for typhoid fever, cholera, and skin disease, which is very, very common, usually scabies or measles. Uh, and then now that cardiovascular disease has become so important, we teach community health workers how to take blood pressure of patients. We know that 30% of them are going to have high blood pressure, so we start them on treatment. So those- Okay, thank you. Questions. Leo? Would you Okay. <laughs> Um, well, I think one through line that we've heard um, through all the examples so far today is really the need to bring services closer to people in need, um, be that through um, mobile clinics, be that through community health workers, integration of um, services into primary health care, community health workers, um, et cetera. And um, I think another important one to highlight is um, providing full immunization coverage for all children, especially older children, um, zero dose and under immunized children. And um, in conflict and humanitarian settings, um, there are whole missed communities, as they're called, where children aren't getting any access to services and encourage you to read up um, on a, a big project that IRC is engaged in, funded by Gavi, called the REACH Project that has shown very um, successful approaches in reaching these missed communities. Um, and then third, I think would be I would be remiss not to mention and, and to highlight um, from the the keynote earlier really this nexus of um, conflict and crisis settings that are affected by climate change that we see are driving infectious disease outbreaks. And so I think this requires really an increased focus on the basics, be that infection prevention, control, wash, um, and community engagement and uh, communication. 
And Joran, you have the last word. Never refuse the last word. <laughs> Advice taken. <laughs> um, so I want to build on my colleagues at the panel, of course, improved access to medical countermeasures interventions writ large. So definitely the nutritional supplementation, immunizations, and prophylaxis um, for conditions like malaria, as well as therapeutics for chronic diseases. Um, the second I want to highlight is just the... Um, need, I think, for a mixed model surveillance, and you probably think you're wide surveillance. We only know what's happening for folks who present willingly to care. So we know that there's the tip of the iceberg effect, and there are a lot of conditions that we may not yet be aware of in these populations that could really improve the quality of their lives. So I think things like wastewater surveillance, pool nasal, pharyngeal swabbing can really help us better categorize the health needs of these populations. And then the last is, um, I'm an epidemiologist, so no surprise on this one. Um, innovative systems for data management. Um, I think we have a lot of lessons learned from some of the mobile populations and killer in Haiti, for example, the mobile where a client can have their encrypted medical record on what's the size of a smart card so that whoever they access care next, they could be able to read it. Um, and just making sure that we don't leave mobile populations and migrants behind when we're innovating for some of our traditional facility-based care because there are a lot of lessons that can be transferred there and really help not just improving the quality of health, but the ownership of one's health along this very treacherous journey. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Well, to all three of you, thank you very much. So I'll hand it back to uh, John.